Assalamu alaikum everyone. Welcome to another discussion on our series on clinical laboratory instrumentation. What we are interested in today is centrifugation. We are going to structure our talk with a brief understanding of what is centrifugation. We will try to link it up with the process of sedimentation and see how centrifugation is inspired from sedimentation. Next up we will see why is centrifugation so important what are some of the applications in historical perspective and even in modern times that make centrifugation so important to study? We will then see how centrifugation works. We'll understand the forces at play as well as the behavior of the particles throughout this process. And finally, we will conclude our discussion with some applications of different types of centrifuges. So different types of centrifuges are used for particular applications and that is going to help us understand the application specificity of centrifugation equipment. So before centrifugation let's understand a basic fundamental thing uh, which is sedimentation. So it's essentially the process of uh, letting or allowing suspended materials to settle down uh, by gravitational force. So it's, it's, it's a gravity-based suspension settlement process. You allow sediments or suspensions in the mixture to settle down at the bottom of your test tube or your container. Uh, you just allow it to settle and in a given amount of time these suspensions are expected to fall down and, and, and rest at the bottom of the tube. Uh, centrifugation, however, is a process where you are making use of a centrifugal force instead of this gravitational force for those suspensions to settle at the, at the bottom. So, and, and separation through sedimentation, it, it could be done naturally with the, with the earth gravity, but again, that would take a lot of, uh, a lot of time. And to speed up that process, centrifugation is just making that natural process way much faster. So it's a technique used for the separation of particles from a solution according to their size, their shape, the density, uh, viscosity of the medium, and, and the rotor speed. Uh, we will see what, uh, how this exactly works because of uh, the constant spinning that's a part of this, um, the rotation of the rotor about a, about a central axis, it generates a centrifugal force which is exerted upon these, these particles in the suspension and it causes them to, to go and uh, deposit along the walls of the, of the tube and ultimately settle at the bottom. So, at the heart of it, it's a process that is used to separate different particles, separate different materials, and uh, centrifugation in sh makes use of uh, the centrifugal force, which is applied through a, a fast spinning of these tubes instead of uh, using the conventional sedimentation process of allowing suspensions to settle with the help of uh, gravity. Uh, now let's look at some of the important applications. Uh, it's one of the most useful and uh, frequently employed techniques in uh, molecular biology, uh, especially in laboratory settings. So centrifugation is uh, it's used to collect cells to precipitate DNA. Um, there are more applications regarding purifying some of the particles, uh, analyzing them are separating them from those infected with virus um, because of different shapes and sizes that different cells could take. And then uh, you could also use it to distinguish uh, subtle differences um, when it comes to the conformation of molecules. So it's, it's, uh, centrifugation is the, it's one of the most commonly used uh, techniques in uh, standard laboratories. One of uh, another important application is the separation of cells and uh, especially platelets from the liquid part of the blood. And in the current uh, context, in the uh, scenario, uh, 
this is uh, even more important to understand uh, how platelets are separated from uh, different uh, other particles in the in the blood. So uh, as you can see in this uh, diagram as well, uh, you have a blood sample. You pass it through a centrifugation through the centrifugation process. The centrifuge is going to contain your the rotor and the mechanism to rotate these uh, tubes at uh, high speeds and uh, at the end of which because different particles have different uh, sizes and densities and viscosities you see these different particles separated out uh, at different positions of the in, in, your, in your container in your vessel uh, so Towards the very bottom, you would see the red blood cells. Um, further up, you are going to see some of the white blood cells, and then the platelets would uh, appear on top. So the idea is that the more and denser the suspension, the more further down the tube it appears. Uh, right, so. As you can see in this demonstration, you have plasma and platelets separate out at the at the at the top of the vessel. And if you were further interested in separating these out, plasma and platelets, you might as well um, drain them into another tube and process the only this particular um, solution and try and separate plasma and platelets as well. Typically, RBCs are uh, relatively lower in terms of percentage of uh, the space they occupy in the, uh, the vessel. It's about 45, 44%, and then there's some space for percentage of white blood cells in the sample. Uh, let's understand the working principle. So, uh, we've understood that the particles are suspended in a, in a, in a liquid medium and they're placed in a centrifuge tube. Uh, what we see at the top, uh, which is the, uh, the liquid part of, uh, or the less dense part of the suspension of the mixture, uh, it's, it's called supernatant. And what we see at the bottom, which is the more dense, uh, the denser part of the solution, it's called as a pellet. So, uh, supernatant is the less dense part that comes out on top after the centrifugation process. Pellets are the suspensions that are uh, deposited at the bottom of the vessel after the tube has gone through the centrifugation process. So uh, let me just uh, demonstrate what this centrifugation process is. We have informally defined it to be a uh, fast spinning or a high spinning rate. Uh, these tubes are spun at a high spinning rate, but essentially these tubes are placed uh, in a rotor which uh, is uh, rotating these tubes at different vendors come with different specifications but you could have multiple tubes being rotated at the same speed so the particles are uh, suspended in the liquid medium they're placed in the centrifuge tube and then uh, you have supernatant in pellets and then uh, but this this process entails that the tube is be placed in a rotor and then spun at, at defined speeds. So as the rotor spins in a centrifuge, there is a centrifugal force which is applied to each particle in the sample. And that causes the particles to sediment 
at the bottom at a rate that is uh, proportional to the centrifugal force which is applied to it. Um, greater the speed of this rotor, greater the centrifugal force applied to these particles, the quicker the sedimentation or uh, the centrifugation process is going to be. Um, also, uh, the radius or the distance between these uh, tubes to the central axis of this uh, rotor. Uh, I'm trying to draw it a bit neatly, but uh, we'll, yeah, we'll we'll take what we get. But the radius of the center of these tubes from the center of the axis right down the center of this rotor is also very important because that also contributes towards the amount of centrifugal force that is uh, applied on these on these uh, tubes and effectively on the suspensions so it's the centrifugal force is uh, a function of the radius as well as the revolutions per minute with which the rotor is uh, is rotating there are also some other factors which play a key role and they are dependent on the nature of the particle that is being suspended or is being separated out from the mixtures. Uh, one of the key factors are uh, density. Yeah, one of the key factors is density, uh, their size, their viscosity. Uh, we always, when we talk about uh, size, we talk about size of the molecule because the greater the size of the molecule, um, the greater the centrifugal force that it experiences. Um, then we talk about uh, temperature as well. The higher the temperature, the greater the flow of the fluid in the in the in the, in the tube, flow of the suspension in the tube, and that facilitates the centrifugation process. Um, then there is uh, always density that we are interested in so there's a but it's, it's not absolute density we're interested in the process of centrifugation is based on the relative densities of uh, the suspensions and the liquid in which those suspensions are so both of those densities are important consider an example of a rock uh, falling down a swimming pool so the density of water and density of rock, they're both important in determining whether or not the rock floats on water. Similarly, if you had a foam, um, then the density of foam itself would not be important. But when you look at the density of foam relative to the density of water, you would be able to make a judgment that the foam is going to float on water. So we're interested in knowing the densities of both of the uh, materials the liquid as well as this mixed this suspensions in that in that liquid so uh, usually what we do is uh, we use heterogeneous materials we use a solid and we want to separate solid from a liquid or liquid from a gaseous uh, mixture so uh, we always have a heterogeneous mixture that we put in the centrifuge um, Apart from densities, their viscosity is also important. So viscosity of a sample uh, solution uh, and is is essentially the resistance to deformation in, in the liquid. It's the resistance to flow. Uh, more viscous liquids would mean they are more resistant to deformation. They are more resistant to flow. So more viscous, viscous, more viscous liquids would tend to flow slower. Um, you could take an example of a cough syrup. A cough syrup uh, would be more viscous than water. Uh, water flows better than any cough syrup. So with with low viscosity, 
which means you are less hesitant, less resistant to flow. If you have low, if you have low viscosity, particles are able to flow better, and they sediment quicker um, and at a lower spinning speed. So you wouldn't need very high spinning uh, speeds. You wouldn't need very high uh, revolutions per minute. So uh, at a fixed centrifugal force and at a fixed viscosity we could fairly say that the sedimentation rate of a particle is proportional to its molecular weight it's proportional to the difference between the density of particle and density of solution um, greater density implies that the size is large and there's more centrifugal force acting on it so it separates quicker uh, We've talked about centrifugal force acting on suspended particles and pushing them to the walls of the tubes and eventually to the bottom of the vessel. Uh, but there are two forces that counteract this centrifugal force. Uh, uh, that uh, that counteract the centrifugal force acting on the suspended particles. So there's a buoyant force. It's the force with which the particles they they must displace the liquid media into which there is sediment so uh, the second force that contracts the centrifugal force is the frictional force it's the force that is exerted on the particles as they migrate through the solution so these are the two forces the buoyant force force with which the particles must displace the liquid media into which they sediment and the frictional force, the force exerted on particles as they migrate through the medium. So these are the two forces that counteract the centrifugal force, or the centrifugal force. Uh, particles uh, move away from the axis of rotation in a centrifugal field only when the centrifugal force exceeds the counteracting buoyant and frictional forces. So only when the centrifugal force is large enough to exceed these buoyant and frictional forces, only then the sedimentation uh, process continues to happen at constant rate. So in, in conclusion, we have talked about how sedimentation is just a result of gravitational force, but in centrifugation, we know that we accelerate this uh, gravitational force by using a, an additional force which is the relative centrifugal uh, centripetal force and uh, when we uh, talk about uh, the reason why we say it's a relative uh, centrifugal centripetal force you know, we always take into account the acceleration due to gravity so it's always normalized with the uh, with g the acceleration due to gravity. So we are always looking at a normalized or relative uh, force and it equals 1.118 10 to the power minus 5 times r which is the radius of the tube, center of the tube from the center of the uh, rotational axis of the rotor and it's in centimeters and then uh, multiplies with the square of uh, revolutions per minute rpm the number of revolutions in one minute for the rotor to take place. The relative centripetal force is going to be measured in G. Since it's relative, it's normalized with respect to um, the acceleration due to gravity, so it's always in G. And uh, that is how we could compute that for a given uh, radius, uh, how much uh, RPM are we going to need if we have a certain amount of centripetal force requirement or how much centripetal force are we going to need uh, if we're going to spin a centrifuge at a particular RPM so we're going to have some uh, questions um, based on these uh, during the class and uh, we will discuss more of this uh, then uh, what we're looking at is not centripetal force. This is relative centrifugal force. There's a slight difference between the two and it's important to use the right naming and convention. 
So all this time we've been interested in centrifugal force and not centripetal force. So the centri the difference between the two is that the centripetal force is the one that causes or a tendency or exerts force on the vessel or test tube in our case towards the inner side of the circle, towards the center of the circle of the, the circle that's that's formed with due to the rotary motion. So if this is our rotary motion in the centrifuge, there's a force acting towards the center of this circle. Uh, this is the centripetal force. And the centrifugal force is exactly opposite in direction and it's acting towards the outwards, towards the far end of the, uh, of, the of the circle and causes the uh, exerts force on the test tubes and the vessels for them to move outwards. And this is the force that we are interested in, the centrifugal force, which causes the suspensions to sediment out and ultimately settle at the bottom of the vessel. So uh, all this time we have been interested in the centrifugal force. We are looking at the relative centrifugal force. And uh, now let's look at some of the different kinds of uh, centrifuges. So we have micro centrifuges which are compact, they're safe, they're easy to use, they're for smaller uh, volumes, um, PCR tubes and strips. Um, then we have bench top centrifuges, they're for uh, rapidly sedimenting materials like yeast cells, which very quickly form sediments and settle at the bottom of the vessel. Then there are super speed centrifuges, they're high speed uh, with the versatile rotor capacities. Uh, they're usually used for large cellular organelles Ultra centrifuges are also used for large uh, cellular organelles. Um, they, the difference between them and the super speed is that the speeds at ultra centrifuges are exceptionally high. We're talking about thousands of RPM. Uh, they're also very ergonomic to use. Now we'll follow up the question and answer session and we'll take on from there.